your impact on a woman's mental health is as a high school athlete, collegiate athlete, and so on and so forth. So we have two wonderful special guests here with us today. Um, Ms. Camille, is it is Dogby, correct? Dogby. Dogbay, okay. Sorry for uh, for that. But so we have Camille Dogbay and Shannon Foreman here with us today, two former um, um, track and field athletes, correct? And basketball. And basketball. All right. So two former track and field and basketball athletes here today to share their perspective and share their testimony on being uh, female student athletes and some of the, you know, some of the things they went through and, and also, you know, leaving our females today with some really good gems and whatnot to take with them as they continue their sports career. So we're going to be getting to that in a few um, Dr. Pitts, we got bowl games going on this weekend. We got the celebration bowl today between Jackson State and um, South Carolina State. This we uh, Coach Prime's last game today at Jackson State. Yeah. Um, so, you know, kind of bittersweet. But like you said yesterday in his press conference, you know, when he leaves, we're going to see what he really did for Jackson State and what could have been yeah. done. Yeah. Um, so yeah. looking forward to that. But as we transition, folks, we're going to transition into our mental health tip of the week. So it's kind of a twofold. I wanted to share a quick mental health tip of the week real quick, um, you know, because on Tuesday, um, I can't remember his name. It was DJ Twitch, for those who are familiar with the Ellen show. DJ Twitch, um, the DJ for her show, had, um, had an untimely passing on Tuesday. He uh, took his life um, Tuesday at a motel down the street from his house and everything. Um, and, you know, every time we see somebody, you know, whether they're a celebrity or just somebody that somebody knows in the community that takes their life, it's never an easy conversation. And, you know, the conversation always plasters itself all over the news and social media of, you know, suicide awareness and things like that. And, you know, unfortunately, we have another Black man who took his life, you know, and I believe he was only 40 years of age, you know, really, really young. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, I always tell people, you know, since I've been a clinician, um, you just never really know what somebody's going through, you know? And I always tell people, you know, when, you, when we see people who, who make that decision to, you know, take their life, um, I would imagine that's never an easy decision. And, you know, talking with people who have been, you know, suicidal, who've made suicidal attempts in their life, you know, that's never an easy decision that they just stumble upon. And oftentimes they feel like that might be the only decision that might make any type of sense to them. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really concerning when I see, you know, our, our, our Black youth, our Black young boys, and also, you know, our young adults and, you know, Black adults who choose to, you know, take their life and things like that. For whatever the reason may be, it's never easy. And, you know, I've learned not to, you know, be as maybe um, quick to judgment when somebody expresses suicide ideation and things like that. You know, being a clinician, I've learned that you know, some, sometimes people's suicidal ideations are only a matter of just not wanting to be in emotional pain anymore, not necessarily wanting to harm themselves or kill themselves, but just not wanting to be in emotional pain anymore. But unfortunately, we have too many oftentimes who do feel like taking their lives is the only way, um, especially for Black men. I think, you know, seeing everybody's comments and whatnot, you know, that they always said, you know, um, he was never, you know, not smiling in the video. He seemed to, you know, be in love with his family, in love with his wife. I think him and his wife just celebrated their nine-year wedding anniversary last week. Um, they had three beautiful children and everything. You know, when we when we see people like that, it's always, you know, well, it's always your strong friends. It's always the ones that's smiling and laughing and seem like everything is going right are the ones who normally do this. Um, and while I'm not going to speak for the entire population of men, um, one thing that I could share with our listeners out there is that, you know, I think sometimes with men, we really struggle with the identity of our self-worth. Um, mm -hmm. And oftentimes as men, we, we attach our self-worth to, you know, our career or to achievements or progress and things like that, tangible things that are very subjective. And if you don't find value or meaning in it yourself, relying on other people to give you that validation for your self-worth or for your achievements or for your success can oftentimes have you on the outside looking in like everything is going right for you or that you know every you know everything in life is falling into place you know your career is going great family is going great personal life's going great when you hang your validation on the opinions of others um, and I'm not saying that's the case here but oftentimes when you know when talking with individuals especially you know young black men and black men in general, about you know how they view themselves and how they view their identity of how they you know fit into the world and fit into society. 
more times than not, the answer is, you know, well, what good am I? If I'm, if I'm not worthy, if I can't work, if I can't provide, if I can't protect, what is my worth here in this society? And what is my worth here in this world? Um, I, you know, want to listen to all our listeners out there, and especially our black men, if you are listening, you know, you are worth, you know, regardless of your job, regardless of your situation, regardless of, you know, what you might feel like your outlook on life is, you are worthy. You know, you're here for a reason. I always tell people, you know, existence is about 14 billion years old and you are here for a specific reason. Whatever that reason is, that's on you to find out. You know, that dash between your, your birth day and your death date, you add meaning and significance to that. So, you know, you are worthy, you are valued and you are loved. And, you know, I hope this message can, you know, touch somebody to, if they are feeling that way, to reach out and get help, you know. There's always a resource out there and there's always an answer out there other than, you know, choosing to take your life, you know, and for those who have either suffered with that or have a loved one that suffered with that, you know, just know there are options and resources out there for your loved one or for yourself to get help. Um, we have the new suicide hotline number 988 that you can always call, or if you can find the number to a local mental health uh, service uh, board in your area or nearest hospital and things like that, please get the help. You know, talking about it does not mean that you're going to do it, right? And I think that's also a big stigma. It's oftentimes when we feel like when we talk about suicide or bring it up, somebody wants to do it or they're going to be more inclined to do it if we talk about it. And that's not the case. If we don't have an understanding of an awareness of how somebody develops that mindset or how they get to that mindset, then we'll continue to miss the point and we'll always continue to sit there and judge somebody for making that choice if we don't allow ourselves to have some type of understanding about it. So... <clears throat> I just wanted to share that this morning and, you know, our condolences to his family and his loved ones and everything. And if you know somebody who might be struggling with this, you know, yes, obviously, you know, check on your strong friends, check on the weak ones too. check on everybody, you know, nobody should not have to worry about not being checked on or asked if they're okay. You know, and, I, and for my men out there specifically, you know, um, I know we're always quick to say, you know, we're good, we're all right, you know, we're making it. Hey, look, if you if you have a trusted friend or somebody that you can talk to, be open and, and honest to them. At least find somebody, one person that you can be vulnerable to and open with, you know. And it might be awkward, it might feel awkward to open up and talk about those things, but keeping it bottled up and keeping it inside you is not the answer either. So um, I just wanted to share that. Um, so Camille and, and Shannon, you know, uh, I mentioned that both of you all are former student athletes and everything. Both of you all played sports, uh, track and basketball. Um, so my, um, not a necessarily a question, but open it up for you all to share a mental health tip of the week um, respectfully. Um, if you all could share something that might be, um, if you could go back to your former student athlete self and share a mental health tip of the week, what might that look like um, if you had that chance? I think what helped for me is I had friends who were also athletes and we could lean on and support each other as we went through the journey. Because as we know, being a scholar athlete is not easy. You're expected to keep your grades up. You're expected to do well in the game and get everything done without excuses. And, you know, I even talk to my students now, they claim to be scholar athletes, but really they're athletes first and school is nothing to them. And I told them, you know, I'd lived the days where I didn't get home from a game till 11 o'clock at night. And I was up till three, four o'clock in the morning with books surrounding me on my bed, sometimes falling asleep in the midst and waking up like, oh my goodness, I got to finish. And then having to get up and go to school at six, seven o'clock in the morning without fail. And it takes discipline. It takes um, persistence. You have to be serious about what it is that you want to do and you have to surround you with like-minded people that are going to help you to continue to forge forward even when you think you can't do it they're going to be on the other line telling you no you got this you got this we can do this together let's meet up let whatever we have to do we're going to do it together thank you for sharing that thank you and, and miss shannon i agree with what camille said 100 percent um i would also say when you're feeling alone by yourself lost um I got to a point where I hated my sport and before I loved my sport and it was what Camille said um the new friends that I made in college none of them were athletes they were scholars but they weren't athletes too and I felt like I was alone um and the only person that I think I really tried to talk to was my dad and he was just so proud 
and blinded by being proud of me, he wasn't listening to me. So I would say, talk to someone, talk to two people, three people, four people, make someone listen to you if they're not listening. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Piz, did you want to share anything? I know you said um, you didn't necessarily have a mental health tip of the week, but did you want to um, share anything before we uh, segue? I'm, I'm not going to share a tip, but I just wanted to point out, um, as I was doing research in preparation for the show, um, the NCAA had done research in collaboration with the NCAA Sports Science Institute and the Division I, II, and Three Student Athletic Advisory Committees. And what the results showed in that research study um, was that 69% of women sports participants and 63% of men sports participants agreed or strongly agreed that they knew where to go on campus if they have mental health concerns. But here's the problem. Less than half of each said they would agree or strongly agree that they would feel comfortable seeking support from a mental health provider on campus. Well, what that means is that you have this vast number of scholar athletes, the larger of which are female, that don't feel comfortable reaching out for help. So to both Camille and Shannon's point, the, the network of teammates, the, the coaches, the trainers, the, the personal friends, that support network is a critical element to preserving the overall well being of these female athletes. You can't just sort of, you know, business as usual. You actually have to be deliberate and intentional in checking in. Yeah, you won yesterday, but how are you feeling? And don't allow just, I'm good, I'm okay. And what I say to, what I say to both of these women and they know, what's that mean? What you, what you really saying to Nani? Don't just tell me that you're okay. What does being okay mean? And, and knowing that it's okay to sort of pre gently press this person that you love and care about so much to find out what's really going on. And in that understanding too, that a big part of that onus is on the school to make sure that they're checking in. Okay, the, these athletes are telling you straight up, I'm not coming to y'all for help. I'm not. So understanding that the support network and the school needs to sort of stand up more and make sure they're very intentional in checking in on these athletes and making sure that there's real answers being given and not this superficial, oh, you know, I'm good, I'm good, and keep it moving. No, sometimes you got to corner folks. You have to corner folks and you have to require them to have a substantive conversation with you about what's really going on with them. Um, the other part of it to, to both ladies' points is that the this, this study also showed that 65% of female athletes agreed or strongly agreed that they take the mental health concerns of teammates seriously. And 56% of both male and female athletes said that they know how to help a teammate with a mental health concern. So keeping that in mind, it's like, okay, folks are aware, we're all human. So it's like, you're not alone. That's one of the biggest issues with mental illness is that these cognitive distortions kick in that tell you that you're all by yourself, that nobody's gonna understand what you're going through. When in actuality, the data shows us that there's a whole bunch of people that can relate to what you're going through because so many are struggling with the same issues and challenges that you are. So I just wanted to just re-emphasize how important the support aspect of it is from a social and a teaming perspective that we really do have the ability to rally around each other and to help each other to stay well. It's interesting. Sorry to cut in, but Ron no, said something in his intro where he was talking about how men feel like when they're not the provider, like when they're not doing mm -hmm. the things they think they need to be doing, how they feel. Women mm -hmm. are no different at yeah. all. I felt that way numerous times. I voiced it to my husband. He's looking at me like, are you crazy? You do A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Mm -hmm. But what other people see and feel that you are doing well in yourself, you don't see that. Yeah. Because you're so 
feel like you're lacking in some way. And I've been blessed. We have seven children total, five of which I gave birth to, two of which I was blessed with. And Mm -hmm. I've always questioned, am I doing what I'm supposed to? Am I just providing or am I giving them what they need? Mm Because I don't want to be that parent who's, oh, I gave you everything from the materialistic standpoint or giving Mm -hmm. you all opportunities, but Mm -hmm. I didn't give you me. And I fought with that for years. I fought with, do I love you enough? Am I really loving you unconditionally? Am Mm -hmm. I really doing, am I being a good wife? Am I taking care of my husband's needs? We all hit that in some way, shape or form. And even as a professional, I questioned, like just yesterday, I was like, am I doing this the way I've always done it? Am I really giving my students my all or am I holding back? Because I see that they're so immature that they're not even functioning at the level they should be. Mm -hmm. And so we all go through that. We all question it. But again, it's who you surround yourself with. The Mm -hmm. other part is there is a huge stigma on mental health. If you go talk Mm -hmm. to a psychiatrist or or psychologist, people start to think, oh, you crazy. Oh, something's wrong with you. But Mm -hmm. that we need to get over that. We need to understand that that is what helps us. After I had my fourth child, um, I went through a period. I didn't know what it was. I just know I went through a really hard period. We had transitioned from a church or we hadn't even transitioned. We left the church. And then in the interim, a group we were a part of that we were really engaged with because we were out due to my issues after having birth. Like I couldn't walk. I couldn't carry my child for a good few months. I had to get to a place and wait for my husband to bring her to do anything. It was so bad that, and I know I probably shouldn't say this on air, but when we would drive in the car, my child was nursed from infancy and I couldn't even pick her from the car seat. So she had to just sit on my lap the whole ride on a nursing pillow so that if she needed something, I could provide it. And it was that not being, always being physically strong and being able to do what I needed to do and not being able to do it when I felt like I needed to do it most. Mm -hmm. And then mentally going through things because spiritually when you're going through stuff and mentally, it's all wrapped up together and you start to feel like, oh, you're not enough. Oh, why is this happening? And my husband said, he got to a point where he looked at me one day and said, where is my wife? Wow. I need her to come back. And while therapy was on the radar, it was like, we don't have time in our schedule for that. But he said he definitely saw a change when I did engage with the therapist. He noticed mm-hmm. that I was able, my mind wasn't racing like he would see it racing anymore. I wasn't thinking, oh, well, my children, oh, we'll work. Oh, well, this, because I wasn't at work for two years as a result. And it was something that was hard to talk about because I didn't want people to think I was weak. Mm. I didn't want people to think that you could, you know, you can't do it. And it wasn't, I got to a point where I had to say, you know what, forget everybody else. Let me go through what I need to go through for me to heal so that I can help others get through whatever it is they're going through. Because too many mothers, too many women don't share their story. They just push through and act like, oh, I got this, I got this. But that's not so. And we have to be more transparent about these things so that the younger generation or women coming behind us or that we're around understand that it's not easy. We're going to battle, but we've got to choose to stay focused on what our end goal is and put in whatever work it takes. Again, it takes practice, just like we have to practice to make perfect on the court or on the field, on the track. We have to do the same thing in life to get through and to be successful in whatever it is we choose to do thank you for sharing that that was powerful thank you thank you so man so as we uh segue into our topic of you know women um in sports and you know dealing with mental health and things like that specifically depression and whatnot um like dr pitts had mentioned at the beginning of the show um this topic is kind of uh premised by you know the events that happened earlier in 2022 Um, We saw during the period of March and April where five total uh, student athletes had committed suicide, four of them being uh, females. Um, One of them being uh, Lauren Burnett, who was 20 years old and was a a softball player from uh, JMU, James Madison University. Um, Another one was uh, Sarah Schulze, a cross country athlete at the University of Wisconsin and 22 year old soccer uh, captain Katie Mayer. Um, who all passed away in early March. Um, Ronnie, to, hold on for two seconds, oh. baby. Let me, the other two were Jaden Hill, who um, was in track and field at Northern Michigan University. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And then there was also Arlena Miller, who was the 19 year old cheerleader at Southern University. I was say, I couldn't think of the uh, girl from yeah. Southern's name. Yeah. Um, and, and so the, uh, according to the NCAA, um, and they said, while suicide rate among student athletes is lower than those of the same age in the general population, mental health concerns for student athletes rose um, about 150 to 200, 250% higher in May of 2020 than historically reported. Um, and so obviously, you know, when the pandemic struck and everything, if you were a student athlete, um, you know, obviously your entire, you know, not only sports career, but life got flipped upside down. Um, a lot of student athletes, whether you were either a freshman coming into school or senior on the way out, you know, your, your career path as an athlete, you know, changed drastically. Um, for some of those, depending on the sports you played, you got an extra year of eligibility. And for others, you know, they had to make the choice of, well, do I stay in school for another year and spend more money? Or do I go ahead and call it a career and segue out into, you know, the real world? Um, so, yeah, and that impacted everybody. But, you know, today's show is about women. And I think this is really important. So, um, Camille and Sarah, I mean, Camille and Shannon, um, I want to start with Sarah's you Sarah's her alias. Sarah's her alias. <laughs> I'm not, I don't think this is that show to ask where the alias came about, but, um, hey. You no, know, we'll start just... calling you Sarah, don't you? <laughs> Sarah um, and So, um, Camille and Shannon, real quick. Um, so kind of talk to the listeners about, and, I, and this was a question that I've always wanted to ask um, female student athletes, you know, because, um, well, nowadays, you know, there are more of a professional um, relevance for female sports and, you know, basketball, track and field, um, softball and things of that nature. But um, so for, for both of you all, kind of talk to the people about how you all got introduced in the sports and how you found, you know, your niches in you all's respective sports and kind of talk about what was your expectations for you all sports careers and then how did, you know, reality kind of set in and whoever wants to go first, by all means, take it away. I told you six questions. I'll go. go. That was three. (laughs) Well, Camille and I are best friends, and we have been since uh, fifth, fifth grade. Yep, fifth, sixth grade. And Camille was always busy. Camille was always doing nine million things. One of those at a young age was track, basketball too, right? Mm -hmm. Right. When I moved around there, basketball started. Yeah. So in, I think, eighth grade for me, um, me and another best friend of mine at our school, we had um, kind of like a trial time of trying out a sport for a few weeks. And then um, it was track. And then there was a track meet at the end. It was just in a mural just to see if you liked it. Um, Prior to that, I was playing volleyball in school. It was in intramural. It wasn't a team. I really liked volleyball. So I said, in high school, I'm going to play volleyball. Well, we did track and I fell in love with track. And then Camille was always telling me about her running and she liked it. And I went to high school and I did track. Well, I fell in love with track. Track was it. I hated high school. I hated everything about high school except for running. Um, I feel you. That's that's how I was about football in high school. Yeah, and I was always in the talented and gifted, but I was lazy. As a student, I was lazy. I did just enough, just enough to run, just enough not to get in trouble because my parents weren't having the bad grades, but I did just enough. But I was all about track. Um, I ran all four years. I was never the fastest by any means. I didn't break any records. I didn't win any first place, second or third in my individual events. I ran the 400 meter, the 800 meter, the four by one, four by two, four by four, four by eight, all four years. We won plenty of things, regional championships, state championships, we went to Penn, we did a lot, I loved it. Um, And then my last two years, I ran summer track. Again, Camille introduced me to that. And then I started with that, best thing ever. Well, I never really thought about going to college. I always wanted to have my own daycare. I told my mom, I'm going to have my own daycare. I'm going to go to the community college. I'm going to do their program there. I don't need to go to college. I don't want to go to college. I hate school. My dad is like, no, you're going to go to college. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to do that. (laughs) Starting when I did my summer track program, I had amazing coaches. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Shout out to high school. Huh? 
Shout out your high school. That was not out of my high school. No, that wasn't out of high school. They were at Suitland High School. Okay. Beautiful downtown yes. Suitland. Yes. <laughs> they okay. were at Suitland High School. And I started running track there. And they were they were great or all the way around from telling us different things with our diet that we could change, what to eat, what not to eat. Um, really, really good with the parents, talking to the parents. They, my 11th grade year, um, my high school coaches meant well, but they didn't really know that much. And I just always did what I was told. I was injured for four years. I had shin splints very bad. It turned out my uh, 12th grade year, I had uh, shin splints and I had been running mm. still because they would just tell me to wrap them, ice them, run. I would keep going. I ended up with stress fractures in both legs wow. where I couldn't even walk. Um, my summer coaches and by the grace of God and prayer and everything, um, I ended up getting a full scholarship to Morgan State University Part was mm. academic, part was track, but they gave me the scholarship and they saw me run and the meet they saw me run, they saw me run in our final um, indoor meet where we won. I think it was regional championships or state. Um, and then my first, I think it was a scrimmage for outdoor. I collapsed with my two broken legs from my stress fractures and they still gave me a full scholarship. That was thanks to my summer coaches and God, because they walked my parents through everything. I was just there signing mm -hmm. what I needed to sign or, you know, I was just there, but I had a list. They're like, you're going to go to college. You're going to go to college for free or almost free. And I'm like, I am. And they're like, yes, you're going to. And I was, I, then I started to believe that because they were supportive and they were teaching me things and showing me things and my mom and dad too. So I did end up going to school for free. I did not want to go to Morgan State. My dad gave me no Dr. choice. Dr. 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 Maven is having heart palpitations right now. <laughs> because because where, where, where is there a state called Morgan at? Not dumb, um, you know, no. It's in Morgan. You know what? <laughs> no, he <laughs> knows. <laughs> <don't be. laughs> And, and Dr. Maiden no. has known her since she was a baby. He's having straight up heart palpitations right now. She didn't want to go. I she definitely. Was so when she picked Morgan. I definitely did not want to go there. I wanted to go to Virginia Tech. And I had an appointment set with Virginia Tech like days after when we went to Morgan. They were going to let me sit with the track team. They were going to give me a tour. I was so excited. And people kept saying, where are you going to school? I'm like, I don't know, but I'm getting a scholarship. And they're like, you know, you're not probably going to get a scholarship. I mean, not that many people get scholarship. And for track, I'm like, I am. Went to Morgan State. Okay. I was but, so excited. But a Hokey fan in New Jersey. That's what's up. <laughs> That's what's up. I'm from Maryland, though. <laughs> okay. She was okay. in Maryland when she when yeah. she went. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Word. Okay. Cool. cool yeah. Cool. I grew up in Maryland. I've only been here the last few years. <laughs> November second, two thousand nine. Two thousand nine. Thank you. <laughs> uh -huh. awesome. So we went awesome. there, and my dad was so excited, and I was like, you know, it was it was exciting and overwhelming because this thing that you've never thought about, never thought possible, and everybody said you can't. And then I started to believe, okay, I can, I get there. Mm -hmm. They're showing me around. They're showing me all the stuff. And then we go in the office and the coach is like taking out all the papers with all the dollars on it. And he's like, <laughs> this is this, this is this. I'm going to give you this. Grades are going to give you this. SATs, you get this, blah, 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 blah. So what you'll pay is zero. <laughs> so oh, then I'm right. looking like. Okay, well, can we call you like the end of the week or something? And my dad's like, come out in the hallway. <laughs> and I'm like almost in tears. Like, I don't want to go here. I don't want to go here. No, I don't. He's like, it's free. It's free. Virginia Tech is not free. It was Virginia Tech, North Carolina a and and South mm -hmm. Carolina State were like my mm -hmm. pops. You're not going to get enough money to matter. You have to go here. It's free. I don't want to. You have to. So we did that for a little bit and we walked back in and signed all those papers. Mm -hmm. Went to Morgan State, got all my stuff. And by me having an academic scholarship also, I stayed in the academic smart people dorm, was on the opposite end of campus from all the other dorms. 
it was on the opposite end of campus from training. It was on the opposite end of the gym. It was near nothing but the academic buildings. The three or four girls that I started hanging out with and became friends with at school, they were there on academic scholarships, not athletes. I okay. was miserable where I went from loving track and track was the only thing that mattered. And I would practice morning, noon, and night extra and everything. No one had to tell me to. I did it because I wanted to. That all changed. I had to walk. I had to get up super early and walk across campus for like training, practice early morning, late. I would miss being able to go to the dining hall and eat. I had to do everything completely by myself. I never really bonded with anybody on the track team. I mean, I would kind of speak, but that was kind of it. And track is a individual lonely sport mm -hmm. um the coaches they coached but it was really it there wasn't any kind of network for this group or that group or you know getting together to do things besides just practice mm -hmm. and it wasn't much conversations happening at track practice <laughs> Um, we had to do study hall and we had to do weightlifting and we had to go see the trainer again. We just went and did those things. It was like, this is what I was told to do. I'm going to go do, mm -hmm. do it and then go back to my room. Sounds and like a I recipe for depression. I hated it. I was lonely and I was miserable. I had, like I said, the, the girls that I was friends with, they weren't in sports. So I had friends, but, and then we traveled. We would go far. I remember riding a bus to Ohio State to run at a track meet and it was a blizzard and we got stuck there. That's all I remember of that trip. I just know it was miserable. Mm. Wow. We didn't have, everybody didn't have phones. I remember my dad bought me a pager <laughs> when I went to college. Like we couldn't talk to people. We couldn't, like it was, it was miserable. And I remember telling my dad, I I'm not doing good. This is hard. I don't like it. It's not fun. I don't want to run anymore. Let me just go to school. I don't want to run. And he was like, no, you're fine. You're fine. You're good. You're there for free. Like, you're going to be all right. It's okay. And I was like, you're not hearing what I'm saying. Right. All money and, good money. and then I got injured again. My shin splint started again. And then mm -hmm. I hurt my back. So then I was there and it was still free, but I was there and I was going to class and I had to go to the trainer and I couldn't even do the thing that I did used to like, and it was miserable. Mm. And I had no one to talk to. And the people, like I said, that I was friends with there, I didn't talk to them because I felt like they don't really care or know, and they're not going to be able to relate. So I didn't tell them. Right. My best friend here and my other best friend, we're all at different colleges. Everybody's doing their thing. I felt like I don't want to, you know, bother them and tell them. So I'll right. just deal with it. Well, my deal with it was I lived at college and I mm -hmm. stopped going to class. Mm -hmm. I stopped doing everything except for when my friends would say, all right, this time we're going to get together and do this. I would get together and do that. And I was happy, funny, life of the party. Shannon, fun. No one ever thought anything, anything was wrong. wrong. My whole mm -hmm. second semester, I just lived at school. Mm -hmm. At any point, at any point, did any coaches or any teach professor reach out and say, "Hey, you know, Shannon, everything all right? Ain't seen nope. you." Nope. Nope. Man. Man. No. So did you? So did you end up? Did you end up finishing your four years at Morgan State? I was there that one year, mm. and when I came home. I never said anything to my parents because I already knew, like I didn't go to class the whole second semester. First semester, my grades were eh, but I was struggling and I wasn't like partying, hanging out. I was doing hundred percent everything I needed to do. And I was having a very hard time. What was your and major? I, um, elementary education. I also didn't want to do that. I wanted to do early um, childhood education for smaller children. I didn't want elementary. I knew all my, I did, I've always said, I don't like big kids. I don't, I don't want big kids. I want the babies. I'm it's the opposite. True. Give me, give me the one, give me the ones that are five years and up. I'm good to go. And see, I need under. Uh, what they talk. And, and Ronnie, what you she's not telling mom? you know what's so funny? She has six kids. She has six okay. kids. She has I'm... six kids. Camille has seven kids. Don't nobody <laughs> else need to have no kids. They have them all. <laughs> Don't nobody hey. need to have no kids. Right. They have them all. And I work in a daycare with babies now. 
but I, I didn't, it was like, I'm coming here. I came here because it was free. Yay, woo woo, you're going to go to school for free. Oh, you're so blessed. You're so lucky. Nobody could do this. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. And then just threw me in on my own and I was on my own. And like, it was, it was terrible. I came home from school. I never told my parents, hey, you guys didn't go to school when that report card comes. That report card came with zero, zero, zero. Like there was nothing on it because I didn't go. I just was there. Right. Man. So when you when you decided not to go back, um, what was that conversation like? What was that transition like? I, I would imagine, you know, obviously the fallout of, you know, having the love of track and field and then, you know, I, I would like to do a study on like, because I always, I think as a collective, people's first year to HBCU is hard. Like I, I wanted to get, I wanted to get as far away from Virginia State after my freshman year as possible. I just, you know, I was on a full ride and, you know, not everybody else was off on a full ride to lineman in division two. So I had to stay put, but I wanted to get as far away from it as Virginia State as possible after my freshman year. But so many people, their freshman year at HBCU have that same mindset, sports or not sports related. Um, but what was that transition like, you know, um, it, not doing track anymore and then, you know, having that fallout? It, it sucked because like I said, track was my thing. I didn't, mm -hmm. I mean, growing up uh, I went to church I was in the choir at church I enjoyed that a lot and then when I started running it was all about running I loved it mm -hmm. um and I didn't love it at that time um and I felt like I let everybody down I felt like I disappointed everybody uh oh she she froze well, why, why, oh. well, I was just going to say, because I want to hear the contrast, because Camille went to a PWI. So I okay. want to know, to your point, to your point, Ronnie, about your perspective that people that attend an HBCU have a really rough first year. Camille, share yeah. with us your experience going to a PWI, because I I think that it's, they don't make a difference where you go. <laughs> like, I think freshman year is hard, period. So what, what was your experience going to a PWI? So I'll go with the sports piece first. So my, yeah, yeah, my intro, yeah. Okay, so my intro to sports was in elementary school, third, fourth grade. I was a cheerleader. I ran track. I actually, it's funny. She says I was her inspiration for track because my cousin who did really well in track and went to college for track as well, I was the one who got her in. Her father was a track athlete through Howard University. He came up on a scholarship from Jamaica and wow. he couldn't get her to do it at all. And then I was doing, I was like, hey, come with me. And I went to a private school, but they allowed outsiders to come and participate. And so she got into it as well. But I did both cheerleading and track when I was in elementary, starting my third, fourth grade. I transitioned to public school and then was doing, I was introduced to basketball via the Boys and Girls Club. And so I started playing basketball. I was also, I did summer track that year as well. Um, as I progressed, I continued basketball all the way through to my 10th grade year of high school and track as well. And that was because I ended up with an injury in, tr in track. We were out at practice and I threw discus and pulled, I, get, I don't wanna say it's my groin, but I pulled something in that vicinity and even to this day, I still have issues where there are times where I might not be able to fully extend my leg and walk properly. Oh, man. Um, I was a pom-pom in high school as well. So that was, I mean, it's not a sport, but I guess it's equivalent to cheerleading to some degree. Um, so I did that through high school. After that, I pretty much stopped with sports and started coaching once I became a teacher. Um, mm -hmm. But my transition, I went to a private school. I went to... Catholic school in DC. Um, I love my alma mater, Archbishop Carroll High School. Um, left there. I was one who was determined that I would not go to an HBCU. I just didn't want to be around the same people I've been around all my life. I knew that the real world was going to look different. And as, and as a result, I wanted to go to a school that was going to give me that experience. And so I graduated top 10% of my class. Um, went into University of Maryland, had a scholarship. This was, please know, University of Maryland was not my on my radar at all. Um, mm. I said I wasn't going to apply. I applied to all of my schools prior to Christmas that year and was accepted into 16 different schools 
that I had applied to. And the only reason I didn't go to my top choice, which was Spelman, was one, they didn't give me money. And two, then I attended an event here with some alma maters from some people who graduated from it. And I didn't like the air that I received. So I tabled them. Um, mm. My last few choices were Pittsburgh, UD, U- University of Delaware, and oh, I guess it was my last four, UMBC and University of Maryland College Park. College Park, I did not apply to until that March or April where the cutoff was. Um, and I was accepted. And as a result of financial reasons, I had to go to University of Maryland. Um, I went in, I had a job on campus and I had a job off campus. My weekends were spent at my off campus job. My weekdays, I was on campus working, going to class. And even though I put in the work, my first semester came out as a 1.0. Um, and I worked hard. I mean, the one class that I got that good grade in was freshman seminar. How can you fail it? Um, I had classmates who came from my high school with me, but their experiences were different. One was a party girl. One was by the books for the most part and had a child. So she had to be focused. And then it was me and I met people there, but there wasn't really anybody to lean on. Dean and I mean, Shannon and I would call each other, but we had two totally different experiences and the schools we went to and what we were dealing with. And even though we would talk to each other and try to encourage each other through it, it's nothing like sitting there doing your best and seeing that your grades just don't add up, especially when you've never gotten such grades in your life. Mm-hmm. Um, there, wasn't, there wasn't that support that you thought you would get. And I went, again, I went to private school. It was a college preparatory program. Will I say I was fully prepared? No. I wasn't. And it wasn't because they didn't give me rigor, but it was because I didn't know what it was going to be like in college. When you go to University of Maryland, not only a PWI, but it is a humongous school. My lecture hall yeah. was 300. My huge graduating campus, class, too. right. It was like, oh my goodness, who are these people? Why are there so many people around? You didn't know your professor. You might have had a TA for that class, but even when you go to those classes, those TAs didn't really care. They're just there to get their credit and walk out the door. And so you didn't get what you were used to. And I was used to, I could go to my teachers and ask for help. I could, you know, talk to my classmates and get that, but I couldn't do that at University of Maryland. I didn't have that support. And it took a lot um, to even make it through. My second semester was better. I, at that point, quit my part-time job on, um, off campus and I just strictly focused on school. And even in that, my grades came up. They weren't the mm-hmm. greatest, um, but they came up. And then I got a probation letter at the end of my first year. One, my scholarship was gone. Two, I was on probation on whether or not I could even attend for my sophomore year or my next year. I shouldn't even say sophomore because I wouldn't have been a sophomore. Um, and I had to do some summer classes. And due to one of my guidance, she was actually over, I guess she was the Dean of College of Human, what was it, of Art Life Science, I don't know what she, she was the Dean of one of the schools or what have you, and Black woman, she talked to me, she helped me through, I contested one of my grades, which took me off of probation, but I still had to um, attend the summer class, which was a study skills course to prove that I could do what I was supposed to do in college. I retook another class that summer, aced it. Um, and then my motivation gained because at that point I'm like, okay, well, I can really do this. So let me get to it. And from that point forward, the only way I was able to graduate on time. Oh, so in my second year of college, I then get in a car accident, which makes me have to withdraw from school. Um, because my back was really messed up and I had therapy that I had to go through. So this is now two semesters gone, a whole year gone in college. I went back my, the second half of the year, pushed through, did pretty well in my classes, started taking summer classes and making it through those. And I was in summer school, I think you're only allowed to take six credits. I was allowed and given special permission to take more than that. So there was some summers where I took up to maybe 16 credits in the summer so that I could get through and then took and it maybe up to 21 credits per semester, mm. graduate just a semester behind everybody else um, that I went into school with. And then was blessed that I had a professor who I was doing a double degree 
in studio art and then in art education. And she calls me around, I think it was Christmas day, maybe the day after and tells me, forget the double degree. You already got your one degree register for this certification program. That's only a year. You'll get your teaching certification through it. I'll write, I'll do your recommendations did it, got into the program. I had to take another semester. She told me take the, un the rest of the undergrad classes because I wouldn't get in my master's program. Did that, started the master's program that year, finished that in a year, um, which was also really difficult because you're taking all these classes and expected to pass with A's and B's. You don't, your support is those who are in the program with you, but when they don't look like you, it's right. hard to lean on them as well. And it, it it was tough, but you have to be determined. When I say it's, it's like you have to have laser focus and know that, hey, this is what I came for mm -hmm. and I just have to push through. And as I tell all those entering college, always start off high because when you start off low, it is hard to get out with a hard, high GPA. I couldn't get past a 2.9 in my undergrad, even though I was hitting 3.7s and 3.8s for the rest of my college career. When I graduated, it was a 2.9. My master's program, I had a three, five or so, but still it's it's a struggle when you start off low. If you're not doing all the things that you need to do, if you're not focused on your studies, if you're not really trying to seek out the help, you're not going to succeed. And I can't say, I'm not, my family was supportive in a sense, but they didn't get it. My family wasn't from this country, they're from Jamaica. So the way that things went there and the way things were here were totally different. So there was no reference point for me to go back to, but to talk to my friends and my cousins who might be going through the same thing. And all of us struggled through, but we made it. And it's hard, it's lonely. And I don't even know what else, I, I'm not, at that point I wasn't, I think I did experience some depression in college. I did, during my master's program, I experienced a little bit of depression, didn't really get it or understand it. But I remember locking myself in my room quite a few days with medication from a car accident like dang should I take this right now just to kind of clear my mind and get it over with but and I think I had to call Shannon a couple times when I went through those thoughts because it gets to a point where it's so hard that nobody around you can help you reconcile it and even when you talk to professionals sometimes this is not to knock professionals but some professionals don't know how to relate to you and they don't really care they're just there to get their paycheck unfortunately and I had a couple of those and I had a couple who tried to push things on me that I definitely didn't want but by the grace of God I was able to come through and that was because I had friends like Shannon I had her parents who were like my parents that's my mom and dad you can't tell me any different um but because of their prayers and them just helping to push us through that's how we made it through but PWIs I it's not easy. I'm just going to say it. it really is. I want to ask you both a question because you both talked about some extensive injuries. And one of the things that we know, it's it's this vicious, in, in an instance of time goes by so fast, in the instance of time, um, you both talked about injury, right? And it's cyclical when it comes to injuries because what we what statistics show us when it comes to female athletes is we see an increase in anxiety and depression when you have injury, but then the anxiety and depression makes you more prone to more injury. So can you speak real quick about as you, as you both were navigating your athletic trajectory from, you know, being young kids through that, what that looked like for you and what role is it playing in your lives today, even though you're mothers and professionals now and not actively involved in your sports anymore? Um, for me, injury has made me feel like I am incapable to do the things that I'm supposed to do. Um, and that's from being injured. When I was young, I hated it because I couldn't go back to track knowing that at any minute I could be walking or running and all of a sudden that thing is going to kick in and I'm going to barely be walking. Um, as a mother, my injury after having my, well, I've had two injuries. I fell right before I found out I was pregnant with my second child and have had knee injuries that led to back injuries since then. 
Um, then I had my, and after that, after her, I struggled and had to go to therapy to try and build that up. They could never do x-rays to really find out what the injury, what happened. So it's mm -hmm. been a fight ever since. After having my fourth, when I could not walk or do anything holding her and could barely take care of myself, um, at that, going through that, that's when depression depression and anxiety really kicked in for me um, mm -hmm. because I feared that I would never be able to do what I was supposed to do or record, at least for my children. How mm -hmm. would I run and play with them? How could I do these different activities with them if I can't even function as their parent? Mm -hmm. And I went through two years of physical therapy. I got pregnant again, which scared both my husband and I because we didn't want the same story. I didn't want to go through that again, but I continued mm -hmm. therapy right up until I think a month before. No, actually, about three weeks until I had him. And then after I had him, I went back and was able mm -hmm. to maintain and build back that strength. So I'm able to do a lot more now, not where I used to be, but mm -hmm. I'm getting there. And it's mm -hmm. taken both my husband's coaching and me coaching myself to say, hey, mm -hmm. we've got to work towards this. The more we work, the better we'll become. Mm -hmm. And then we can get back to some sense of normalcy or even be better than we were before because mm -hmm. you'll be able to coach yourself through those things that mm -hmm. you need to go through and stress doesn't help because stress just leads to more injury mm -hmm. like as stress as dr nani knows <laughs> you go through graduate yeah. programs yeah. there's certain yeah. graduate programs that are not like any other and when you go through the mental abuse you have to go through for that, that it wants makes you want to quit it causes you yeah. to stress you lose sleep you definitely lose sleep because you're studying but you lose even yeah. more sleep because when you do get to sleep you can't focus mm -hmm. and my body's kicking back at me right about now with even all of that stuff. And yeah. it gets to a point where you start to think you're not capable and you're never going to accomplish the things that you set your mind to. And yeah. it's, it's hard, but it's surrounding yourself with those people yet again, who are going to mm -hmm. remind you of who you are, mm -hmm. who've known you. Shannon does it all the time. My husband does it. If I call Dr. Nani, I know she's going to do it without yeah. fail. Um, yeah. And it's just, yeah. again, keeping your circle close and tight yeah. and knowing who you can go to for that building up. Absolutely. What about you, Shannon? And I have a follow-up question, Shannon, once you answer too, because you both coach. You both coach the sport now that you love so much and, and participated in for so many years. So I want to speak to that too before we close out today. Go ahead, Shannon. Um, with my injuries, being a student and when I was still a a kid and a young adult, I kind of completely 100% trusted the people that were supposed to know more than me. Like I said, in high school, my coaches mm -hmm. didn't know anything, but I didn't know anything either. So I thought you're the coach, you know, I do what you say. Mm -hmm. I, hurt, I got hurt more. Mm -hmm. um, I just kept going. I would just suck it up. I would, I never really like took a bunch of medicine or anything, but like rubbing on like the creams, the icy hot, the, those kind of things, mm -hmm. wrapping it up, taping it up, just keep going until, you know, I would just suck it up. And I think anybody that's an athlete and competitive, like, I feel like these kids now they're different because they're not always competitive. They just kind of do it for fun. We're different. Like we're mm -hmm. super competitive. So it was like, if I can walk, I can run and I'm running until I lay on the ground and you have to carry me off. So mm. I just kept going. Um, in college, <clears throat> I didn't so much, but it was because I wasn't loving it either. Um, mm. And like Camille said, I didn't have, I had all of you guys, family and friends, but you weren't there with me. I didn't see you and talk yeah. to you every day. So it was different. I felt alone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, once I wasn't in school anymore and I came home and I started working and hanging out and stuff, but I started running again because I wanted to. And it was mm -hmm. like a stress reliever, not adding stress to me now. Mm -hmm. And then as a parent, well, before even a parent, when I came home, I was home maybe a year or so. My dad coached at the high school I graduated from. He coached my mm -hmm. sister actually and mm -hmm. asked me to come out and help. I came out to help and coached the girls team to two championships. Mm -hmm. um, that made me love running more and I had something to teach and give. And then it felt like, okay, I don't suck in life. I can, I can do this. <laughs> um, I don't suck. <laughs> I don't suck. Then mm -hmm. I fast forward as a parent, my dad and I started a, um, uh, AAU Community track, track club, club up here, uh, Christian based. It was his idea. It was his idea. And then he said, here, do it. And I did it. And we did it for five years mm -hmm. um and we're trying to get it back up now but 
coaching those kids and working with those kids, coaching those th- those kids through injuries, being able to talk to them, knowing the mm-hmm. difference of this one, you need to yell mm-hmm. at it, it's going to make them do what you want. This one, you need to hug them and it's going to get them to do what you want. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Not pushing somebody when they're injured, pulling them even when they're pissed at you and their parents are pissed at you. Like, no, they need to go see this doctor. I'm not going to keep breaking Mm -hmm. your kid down like that was done to me we're not doing Mm -hmm. that because that's not the most important thing and then later when I wasn't even running doing absolutely nothing I injured my back and the doctor tells me well you're 30 but you have a 70 year old back did you do sports when you were younger yeah Mm. I I ran track oh yeah a lot of athletes have bad problems with arthritis and I have herniated discs in my back from Mm. like running 10 Okay, well, I got all the way better, lost weight to where I can run again. I go back and forth with that. But now, like Camille said, I guess from all of our experiences and all of our, you know, coming through what we've been through and still having a good support system, Mm -hmm. um, we know we can come through it. And sometimes I have to tell myself, you did this four times before. You can do it again. Uh Like, just got to do it again because you already did it. You can do it. Right. Word, word. Tell each other constantly. So it it makes a big difference. Your cousin, your your cousin brother texted me and said that when (laughs) Uncle Gio handed you over Salem Striders, it was because you were falling into your purpose (laughs) and that you had to, both of you, had to go through everything that you went through through your athletic trajectory so that you could coach these kids to championships today. That's what he meant to say it on text oh. message. That's what he said. Yeah. So we, in the instance of time, we'll wrap up in, in a couple of minutes because I, I do have a couple of other key things that I really want to make sure that our listeners get. Our kids today, our female athletes, our athletes, period. Ronnie and I talk about this all the time, more so him than me because we're a different generation. I'm I pay somebody to manage social media. I don't. Right I don't, now, I have daughters who are. Right, right. When you think about female athletes and how females are, and it's not that guys, Ronnie, don't catch feelings. It's <laughs> not that guys don't deal with image issues and stuff too. But I really believe, personally, professionally, clinically, I believe that image issues is on a whole nother level when it comes to our female athletes. Talk for a minute about the impact that you believe that negative social media has on our female athletes within that context of anxiety and depression. Because I get it. Like, and you all know with the college, with the clients that I have, it's like everybody's comparing themselves to everybody. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I believe it's huge. I feel like these Mm -hmm. kids, they, they hear us say it and they hear people say it. What you see somebody portray on social media is not real. Mm -hmm. It's not real. It's Mm -hmm. what they want you to see or Mm -hmm. what they've completely made up and what you're just seeing little snippet. And that's all, you know, Mm -hmm. so you take it for fact, my own children, I have three teenage girls, 18, Mm -hmm. 17, 16. And we can, yeah, we can tell them these things and they just roll their eyes oh, ha, ha. you don't mm-hmm. know you don't know I do I was a teenager I it mm-hmm. none of that matters but we didn't have that mm-hmm. we didn't have to deal with that yeah and they my children where we are is predominantly white area and there's maybe five or six black kids wow. and other minorities maybe one or two kids I mean it's like nothing and they all they'll tell me mom you don't know what it's like I don't know what it's like to be a teenager in that situation. I know what it's like to be an adult in that situation because everywhere I go, I'm usually the only one. But as an adult and after being through what I've been through, I don't care. But as a teenager, you care Mm -hmm. about all this stuff that doesn't matter. And they believe all these things. And we're still trying to figure out how to get them to not believe all that fakeness and not compare yourself Mm -hmm. to all that social media and everything else. Camille? Mm -hmm. Um, from a, I'll even go from a teacher standpoint, it, social media is horrible. Um, there have been fight after fight after fight at my school and take a while. Yes. If there's seven fights, how many of them are girl fights? Six and a half. (laughs) You're absolutely right. It's always the girls and it's always over social media or a boy. Mm -hmm but still surrounding social media. media. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and I've tried to explain to like, we have an 18 year old. He just got a phone when he was 17, just mm-hmm. got on social media in the last, I don't even want to, in the, since June, mm-hmm. in the last six months, because I knew who I was dealing with. And I was like, yeah, you don't need to see this. And the only reason was a, it was allowed was because a program for the University of Pittsburgh, he was a part of, that's how they got their information out. So mm-hmm. I said, you know, you got to join for this reason. But then you go and you find a whole lot of other stuff and it starts to dominate your life. Mm-hmm. And you don't understand that like these generations. So when we were young coming through, a lot of us were more mature for our age yeah. than normal. These generations, they might have the body and the type, the, the, the frame and all of that of a grown person. Right here, but right. mentally, they are a good... I. I'm going to say five to six years behind Mm. and they don't get what you're telling them. When you say, look, social media is not portraying to you the reality of what's going on. Even as adults, I mean, as adults, you struggle sometimes like that. I found myself, I caught, I catch myself all the time. Like, oh, look at them. They're having such a great life. And I'm like, please, that's probably not even real. Hush. (laughs) Don't even think about it. (laughs) They don't know that everybody's just putting out a good face they're just showing you what they want you to see whereas when we were growing up we saw that when we saw them in person like they would be dressed nicely and acting like they're miss sweaty or whatever but behind the closed doors all hell was breaking loose mm-hmm. but these kids see it every day i have a student who cuts i've had students who cut i mean and when i say cut i mean i've never seen it like this before all over wow. literally mm-hmm. And you're looking like, what is driving you to a point where you feel like that's the only way? And that person is very free in relating what they're going through. Oh yeah, I've done this. I've been in psychiatric wars. I've done this. I missed this many days. This, like last year had 900 and something absences across classes because they were in a facility. Wow. And this generation is really hit hard by everything coming at them with social media, with the media. We don't mm-hmm. watch a lot of that stuff. I mean, we had TV. That was what impacted us. Now mm-hmm. all the social, all the media stuff, are, oh, the real me. And that's what they claim to be showing. And our kids do a lot of streaming stuff. They don't watch TV like we used to. But mm-hmm. even in that streaming stuff, they're seeing how much of this foolishness are they getting where they think, oh, this is how I have to be. This is what my life needs to be like. This is how I have to behave. This is how I have to treat people. No, that's not it. And that's what they're not getting. And they don't have parents sometimes that can give them that information. Unfortunately, a lot of the current generation is those who had their babies too young Mm -hmm. and didn't wait until they were mature enough. And I hate to put it that way but that's what I'm running into when I have a, I have a student who told me yeah my mom was 42 when she had me that's why I have all my issues and I looked and I said excuse me I find that to be quite disrespectful because I just had a child and my mm-hmm. child is fine well your child's not a teen I said no you have to understand you have a choice in this too yeah and you can't mm-hmm. blame everybody else for your issues and that's the other thing they're very entitled they don't take responsibility for anything it is mm-hmm. everybody else's responsibility to give them what they need but they don't have to work for it and we did a disservice to them when we changed grades and it was oh don't write in red ink because that hurts their um ego oh don't give them f's we're going to change it to e's because that's a softer blow oh let them make up all their work because if you let them make up all their work they're going to pass that is a lie from the pit of hell i have to who will turn and work till the day the quarter is done and they still failed my class right we've softened right. everything for these kids and they're not learning resilience mm-hmm. they're not learning how to persist and how to be what is the word i'm looking for where you just keep going the word is not coming perseverance they don't have, they don't have, perseverance. Tenacity. They don't have tenacity they don't mm-hmm. have any of it because they've never had to work for anything in their lives yeah because yeah. you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings right and even as mm-hmm. athletes I find this whole baby mentality, like don't mm. work them too hard because they can't take it. And I'm like, no, that's unacceptable. I'm going to work you hard because I want the best out of you. If mm. you want to perform well, you got to practice well. Yeah. And it's when it comes a down of life, right. life, you don't get anything good or worth having just given mm. and handed to you. That's not how it works. Right. Mm. If somebody hurts your feelings. No one cares in the real world. <laughs> And even as a coach, when it comes back to injury, I don't feel like I was told to, hey, go to the doctor and find out what's going on. That was never pushed. It was, oh, you got an injury. Okay, we'll just ice it, rest it. Keep going. And that's what he says that all the time. 
right put some ice and keep going exactly and that's what we did and it was funny I never had shin splints at least that I noticed until I was in college and I was teaching when I started teaching is when I got shin splints and I had no clue like they were so bad they affected my ankles to the point I couldn't walk and when I finally went to the on-campus doctor and was like hey what's going on they're like oh you're a teacher oh you played sports oh yeah this is what it is you need to wear you have to wear these special inserts for the rest of your life you have to do these stretches for the rest of your life and it's horrible like now with my own children my, my children are starting to play um uh what is it boys and girls club or intramural whatever it's mm. called basketball my daughter mm. had an ankle injury for a while and she's like oh I'm just gonna tough it out and I'm like honey you're not walking straight you can't play but mommy I really want to I get it but I need you to sit down for a couple of practices because I'm not going to put you through that mm. and as a mother as a parent as a coach you have to coach them through these things and let the parents know hey your child is injured take them to the doctor this is what I think it might be. I might be wrong, but I want you to go check it out because I don't yep. want them to have a lasting injury that's going to impact them for the rest of their lives. Right. Right, that's real. Ronnie, you um, you often, you know, and I know you have folks that you mentor and you've coached and all of that stuff too. Can you, real quick, can you speak to, tie it together, tie it together because I think one of the interestingly enough one of the things that we didn't touch on is you know like love and basketball is a good depiction of it right where you have the couple that are both actively involved in sports and what that looks like and Ronnie you've talked a lot on different shows about the relationship aspect of athletic play and, and it was a particular show where you talked about your own depression and issues and within that context of the support network, can you just speak real quick to the intimate relationship component in supporting your partner through anxiety or depression around injury or just around athletic performance deteriorating at all? We'll get, let you do the man's perspective. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, I always, you know, I didn't really start, I didn't have a, like a girlfriend or anything when I played football until I got to college. Um, I always felt like it was a distraction to because I knew I wasn't going to give enough of myself in a relationship to that would be fair because I used to always tell people like look during football season when I'm training I can't give you what you want and that's just what it is like you're not going to help me get to where I need to right now it's no knock on you but I got a mission and you know so a lot of the times like you know when when I got to college and whatnot and I really started dealing with injuries yeah, I didn't necessarily have a significant other to, you know, necessarily rely on and everything. So, you know, for that emotional support or for that, you know, um, intimate support or whatever, you know, outside of just like, you know, just regular family support and everything, I didn't necessarily have that from a partner per se. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't until my last year of playing when I got with my uh, wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, like she was kind of the first person to really see, you know, at the forefront, like what I was going through on a day in and day out basis of having to, you know, push my body through um, just unspeakable pain, you know, mm -hmm. just like really just trying to just make it through the season. And mm -hmm. a lot of the times, you know, um, for her, she learned a lot too, because, you know, a lot of times people don't understand like, well, you know, when you get to college, like those sports are, it's demanding, it's, it takes up all your time. And so, you know, you don't really have a lot of time for your partner and whatnot. So they have to be also understanding that, mm -hmm. you know, they might not get all of you during that time and that has to be okay. But when they do give you that time, you know, quality time, a lot of people don't really understand that part quality, you know, because it's not mm -hmm. the amount of time, it's what you do with the time that you're, you know, allotted and everything. So um, trying to balance that can be a lot, trying to balance that, you know, between being an athlete, have feeling the roles and responsibilities you do as an athlete, also top of being a student and also the social piece of having, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. you know, having to balance that too. You know, those are a lot of things that, you know, they're microcosms of life that, you know, while you're a collegiate athlete or even a high school athlete that you get a first hand of. And it can be difficult to handle sometimes if you don't have the right support around you or the right messages being told to you. You know, if somebody's just telling you to just push through, push through, push through mm -hmm. for their benefit, then, yeah, you probably will, you know, end up putting yourself in a very unfavorable position. Mm -hmm. So, look, folks, you know, one of the things that um a couple of things I want to put on your radar as we're wrapping up for today. We go over sometimes we go, it's the joy of having my own show. I can do that. Um, 
just some key things I want to point out. There, there are definitely some things that you need to be aware of um, where female athletes and depression and anxiety are concerned. We're females, period, because there's definitely some things that impact us in ways that don't impact men. But first and foremost, it's really important for people to understand that depression is a real medical condition. It really is. And to your point, when we were first opening up, you know, we talked about, and Ronnie and I talk about this week in and week out about the mental health stigma that exists among black and brown persons and, and within our communities and our families. And, and so oftentimes what we hear, and I just get over it, just get over it. I mean, you're going to be all right. You're going to be, it's okay. Not bad it's not me. that serious. Wow. Quit being extra. Yep. You know, yep. you, you, you all emotionally needy. You, you know, you uh, just stop. But depression is real. And you can't just snap out of depression. There's actual work that needs to be done to be able to combat it. But if you won't acknowledge that it exists, how can you address it and get the help that you need? The second thing is, is that depression can hurt literally. It, it can have, it, it, it can manifest itself in so many different ways, persistent sadness and, and having that feeling of emptiness, feelings of hopelessness and or pessimism, irritability, feelings of guilt, worthlessness or helplessness, decreased energy or fatigue, difficulty sleeping, you know, oversleeping, a change in your appetite, and the list goes on and on and on. But here's the thing. There are certain types of depression that are unique to women. And when you factor in that added element of female athletes, you, and, and, and Camille, you touched on it, right? We, we have issues with um, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, pre perinatal depression. Um, you know, we, Ronnie and I have talked on shows before about the issues that athletes go through if they get pregnant and they're on scholarship or, or what that looks like. Um, paramenopausal depression depression affects each woman differently. So when you look at the female athlete and, and Shannon, I think you touched on it about track being a lonely sport, right? Versus basketball being more of a teaming sport. We can't dismiss the role that what sport you play and how that can impact your um, experiences with depression it's relevant. It is absolutely positively critical to pay attention to that. I remember um, it was last season, we had three of Shannon's girls on the show and they were talking about the, the, the pressure and, and how it affected their mental health and what that looks like. And they talked about body image and they talked about their eating habits and how all of those things statistically are connected to depression and what that looks like. So we really need folks to understand that it's not just about performance. It's not just about performance within the sport and academically. Parents, we need you to be aware. We don't want any of your girls to be among these statistics of those five women's names that we shared at the beginning of the show. Depression is real and depression untreated can lead to suicide ideation and it can lead to suicide attempts and it can lead to death. It is a very serious matter, but we want you to know that it absolutely positively can be treated. One of the things that I want you to take into consideration as you're considering looking for a therapist, you I tell folks, you have to test drive a therapist like you would test drive a car. Ronnie might not be for everybody. Lauren might not be for everybody. Don't make the mistake of thinking that just because Ronnie is a male clinician that he can't treat a female athlete. He can. He has wholeheartedly committed because there are definite, yes, there are some things that are different from a, a female athlete to a male athlete, but then there's some things that are conceptually the same, right? So he absolutely has the capability to provide the clinical support and guidance that any athlete may need, even a female athlete. So we want you to test drive your therapist. We want you to ask about our areas of expertise. We want you to find out about 
the kinds of treatments that we use. We want you to find out how we'll evaluate your progress. That's one of the amazing things that Ronnie can offer on a whole nother level that I can offer. And I've got a, a bunch of athletes on my caseload, but he can offer that perspective because he can not only evaluate progress as a clinician, but he can evaluate progress from a healing perspective as it relates to like injuries and what that looks like in the different ways. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to keep looking until you find the right therapist for you. Um, Ronnie mentioned at the beginning of the show, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline number is 988. Now they change it from that 1-800 number. You can use the crisis text line at hello to 741-741. You can do the Lifeline chat. Folks, this thing is real. This thing is real. It's exacerbated during the holidays. Um, there's just not enough emphasis that we can put on how important staying abreast of the impact of depression on our female athletes, because there's so many other things, you know, I cannot even imagine. We didn't even touch on Brittany Griner. We didn't even touch on that, right? But one of the things that I appreciated when I was watching the news is she was landing back here in the U.S. They said she was under she was undergoing a psyche valve. Heck yeah, you better believe it. She and and oh by the way, not only undergoing a psyche valve but ongoing treatment for quite some time because now you're adding the element of incarceration. And who knows what she went through being incarcerated? The list goes on and on. Um, thank you both so much for joining us today and, and for coming to Nani's rescue. Um, I just knew that I knew that I knew Ronnie and his crazy self text when he talking about, you know how y'all are when it comes to men sharing a female perspective. I'm so glad you got, you got some color at least confirmed for this stuff. I say he's so very simple. There's something wrong with him. But thank you both um, thank from you the both, bottom yeah. of Thank you for, having us. for being on today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, we, um, we did, we can't thank you enough and, and having an intimate personal connection to both of you and remembering those days, remembering, you know, the, the, the track meets and the wincing with pain. I'm like, they hurt. They, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. No, I'm okay. I'm okay. No, you're not. Uh, stop lying. God's not pleased. <laughs> but that's what they trained us to do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and I just, try to make sure that I don't do that. Like I, I don't. And I, I feel like I get on their nerves and I tell them I don't care because yeah. I had the opposite happen with me. Yeah. Yeah. Elise is eight and she was mad when I told her, no, you're not going to practice, right. but yeah. it was great. That's benefit. Yeah, it is. Each of you drop a gem of, um, give, give our listeners one final mental health tip a piece. Ronnie, I do want you to, to share in that as well. And then we're going to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. Wish my Dallas Cowboys good luck against them Jaguars and the Philadelphia. Not that part. <laughs> <laughs> Not that part. <laughs> Camille, you want to go first? Sure. So one thing that we talked about, but we didn't really talk about in the show was we talked about competitiveness, competitiveness competitiveness but mm -hmm. we talk about it on the court on the field while we're playing but we all one something that all of us also had was competitiveness in the classroom and in life mm. we came across the board we didn't just do it in one area mm -hmm. um, so that's one another thing I noticed was we talked about looking for Ronnie brought it up looking for validation from others mm. the biggest takeaways that I've come up I've come away with in the last few years I can't let anybody else validate me mm. I've got to validate me because mm. if I don't think I'm enough then no matter what I do nobody else is going to add up nobody else is going to give me that and so we have to know who we are and be comfortable in our own skin and not let others define who we are what mm. we are how we do things or anything else 
Mm -hmm. Um, And then something else that helps me from time to time, I'm not a big journaler, but I know when things are really hitting and I can't talk to anybody, the Mm -hmm. only way to get it out is sometimes to either type it in my notes section of my phone, write Mm -hmm. it out on paper, type it on the computer, whatever is near me, I'll use that to try and get stuff out so that it's Mm -hmm. not sitting in my heart and festering. Mm, that's good. Thank you. Shanna. I would say I'll take it back to my dad. When we made our, our track team, he said we have to come up with a slogan. And I'm like, a slogan? I don't know. Well, our slogan was we, that I came up with was we never quit. Mm. He always told this story about when I was running summer track and it was a relay and the baton got handed to me and we dropped the baton and it was the race to qualify for junior Olympics for nationals Mm -hmm. and we dropped the baton but I picked it up and kept running we would have got disqualified but we didn't because I didn't give up and he was like most people would have quit most people would have gave up do not quit don't take the easy out and suicide is the easy out and many things would tell you and trick you to believe that you can just end all the hurt and the pain. You'll end your hurt and pain, but you'll hurt many, many more people, which you'll never know how many that care about you and love you because you never know what impact you're having on somebody. Sometimes by just saying hello, asking somebody how they're doing, just being polite and pleasant to somebody. And if you're hurting, if you're feeling, however you're feeling, be honest. When someone asks you, be honest. You don't have to be honest to the person on the street saying, hey, how are you doing today? You're not going to spill your guts to them. But pick a person that you trust and be honest and talk to them. Don't just say, I'm good, I'm good, I'm fine, when you're not. Because if they don't know that you're hurting, they don't know how to help you. I, I appreciate both those um, tips that y'all both left. And if I had to add anything else to that, it would be like I always say, you know, it's not about being perfect. It's about, you know, finding true happiness to yourself. So I believe in, you know, getting 1% better each day, no matter what that looks like for you, you know, you no, bro. You got the ability to get 1% better if you just take the time and have the patience with yourself to know that perfection should never be the goal. It's just being your true authentic self. So that's what I'll leave everybody with today. Um, and thank, once again, thank both of you all for and sharing, you know, your testimonies and all the knowledge that you all shared this morning is really appreciative. We went way over today and I'm sorry. I just, I I wanted this conversation to be robust. Um, You know, the whole suicide piece. And I just, when I think about my own clients just in the past couple of weeks and the escalation that I've seen my own clients in reporting to me that they're having suicide ideation. It's heartbreaking to me. So I wanted to to really make sure that we gave this the appropriate attention that we need to. Um, Please know folks that yes, it is the holiday season and I am persuaded that one of the simplest ways to battle depression is gratitude. Um, Depression tricks us into thinking that we're all alone and nobody loves us and nobody cares about us and that we don't matter and that everything is wrong. And you've heard me say time and time again on the show that what we feed grows and depression at its infancy is just obsessively focusing on the negative. It's obsessively focusing on everything that's wrong. And if we can just shift that focus to gratitude and and look at the good that we do have in our lives, look at the blessings that have been bestowed upon us, look at the fact that there are people all over the world who have life far worse than we ever thought about having. There are people who are incarcerated who will never come home. There are people on death row. There are people that have handicaps that have debilitated them so that they could never even play in sports at all. You know, and the list goes on and on and on. And I really believe being deliberate and intentional and expressing gratitude is a beautiful way to begin the process to take charge and to, to 
look depression in the face and say, you're not taking me out of here. I want to take this opportunity to wish everyone a, for those that celebrate, whether it's a Merry Christmas or Happy Kwanzaa, um, just enjoy the season. Um, give yourself permission to experience the beauty and blessing of the holiday season with family and friends and loved ones. And it gets better. It gets better. Suicide is a permanent solution to temporary problems. <clears throat> it doesn't have to be that way. So I want to wish you all a wonderful holiday season. Ronnie and I are getting ready to go on holiday break. So we'll be back uh, whatever the first Saturday in January is. I think it's January 7th. I think. 7th. January 7th, we'll be back to kick off the 2023 season strong. Um, a lot of great guests lined up, a lot of great topics lined up going into the, the spring season. Thank you both so much for joining us. Happy holidays, everybody. Go Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> Don't worry. New Year, same Cowboys. It's all good. <laughs> Y'all have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, everybody. Thank y'all for tuning in. Thank y'all in the new year. Bye-bye, everybody.